I just wanted you guys to see that uh, picture of Mark Lamont Hill again, because I know there's a lot of people on here that probably think it's me. It's not me. It's Mark Lamont Hill. We all don't look alike. We're going to have a good show tonight. I make these these intro videos, um, and I put them up. Now I'm getting a little better at putting them up before the show. I try to do it a day before. Sorry. But this one, I had I did not know the show was going to be this interesting for 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 people that the comments on the video would start rolling in, even comments in the Patreon, comments on the on Facebook. <laughs> so uh, I'm getting myself ready. We are moderatorless now, so I'm getting myself ready for a very fun and spicy chat i wish i was live for the pre-show discussion which was kind of off the hook with our guests and pascal who are our old friends um so let me bring in my co-host my homie my dog who is ready today he is he is definitely ready he pitched this show probably about a month ago and i don't even think he knew how spicy this one's about to get. Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. I was enjoying the conversation you brothers were having before we went on air. <laughs> you look like you liked it. You look like you wanted to sit down and have you know, a nice I cool, cool I beverage. Out. I went and got a glass of water. I sat back and listened. I know how to shut up. I don't always have to interject if I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Before we bring on our guest, let's get you guys ready for the show today with this video. And I do want to say the first clip in this video, I had no idea who this person was. I was literally just looking up people that weren't Mark Lamont Hill talking about critical race theory. This person came up. I have no idea who she is still. I didn't find her jokes funny, but I just want you to know that I don't want people to think that I'm a fan of this person. Enjoy. In the past few weeks, several state legislatures have introduced bills banning critical race theory. They've done it in Georgia, Tennessee, Florida, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and a bunch of other states where you can buy Confederate flags at gas stations. But the thing is, while some Americans are furious about critical race theory, a lot of people don't even know what it is and I don't blame them. Critical race theory sounds like the subtitle of a book called Mario Kart for Dummies. First, I'm gonna pick up speed, then I'm gonna throw some nanas, then I'm gonna get some coins, and that is my critical race theory. Now, in order to talk about critical race theory, we're gonna start with something called the 1619 Project. The 1619 Project is an extraordinary Pulitzer Prize winning work of journalism, conceived of by a reporter named Nicole Hannah-Jones. It was released to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of enslaved Africans in the colonies that would become America. That's right. The first anniversary is paper, the fifth is wood, and the 400th is well-researched and award-winning journalism. Many liberals and progressives have been circling the wagons defending critical race theory as part of a new culture war. The desire to defend these ideas stem from the reactionary right wing using critical race theory as the new boogeyman that is harming the narrative of American exceptionalism conservatives so desperately cling to. In this episode, we will discuss the assertions of critical race theory and inquire, do these theories challenge capitalism and wealth hierarchies? Or is this simply a plea for more liberal anti-racism that seeks to diversify the ruling class as the overall pie shrinks for the rest of the nation? This is revolution. Critical race theory begins from the assumption that racism occurs in all interactions. To see how this works, consider this thought experiment. Imagine you own a shop and two customers enter at the same time, one white and one black. Who do you help first? If you help the black person first, critical race theory would say you did so because you don't trust black people to be left alone in your store. That's racist. If you help the white person first instead, critical race theory would say you did so because you think blacks are second class citizens. That's racist too. I'm here today to talk about those things 
that unite us as Americans, and I'm here to talk about those things that divide us. I'm worried that President Biden is nominating for federal office individuals who do not share a view of America as a good and decent place, who do not believe that the history of this nation is worth celebrating, nominating instead people who believe that this is a country founded in racism and shot through with corruption. Many of these nominees are partisans of a viewpoint that goes by different names, but shares several features in common. A view that America is a systemically racist place and systemically unjust. A view of America as corrupt. A view of American society as one that needs to be deconstructed, that needs to be pulled apart, torn down, and then rebuilt in a fundamentally different way. Now this broad ideology has become known in public as critical race theory. And that was, uh, that was your very own Josh Holly. There you go, America. Our guest, Paul C. McComb, is a Haitian philosopher and sociologist. He currently works as a professor of philosophy and sociology at West Virginia State University. Paul does research in sociological theory, social theory, Haitian studies, and social and political philosophy. Please welcome, coming all the way live from West Virginia, Paul McCoy. Thanks Paul. for having me, Jason Pascal, but I'm actually in Florida right now. Oh, word. He is oh, a dual appointment. <laughs> Paul McComb, scholar, intellectual extraordinaire. My man, my friend, uh, for the audience who does not know, I have known Paul for several years now, probably about five or six years. Mm -hmm. We've actually appeared on a few panels together, one on Pan-Africanism, and we used to do a panel every year during the anniversary of Haitian Flag Day, mm -hmm. and uh, we haven't done that stuff, particularly in the age of COVID. And him and another Haitian scholar who was a Dr. Sir Joseph, together we used to call ourselves the Three Musketeers because we kind of... <laughs> You know, worked off each other and uh, did some presentations and things, things of that nature. So, to for us to understand why Paul is here, Paul wrote an article a few years ago that Jason's probably going to share uh, with uh, the chat and post uh, against critical race theory. And Paul, for those who do not know, Paul, you can intercede and correct me if you think I miscategorized mm -hmm. your thought. Mm -hmm. Paul is an orthodox structural Marxist. I Now, let me make this clear. I use Marxism as a s economic and social critique of cap capitalism, but as Paul knows, I am not an orthodox structural Marxist. Marxism for me is a tool. It is not an ideology that I am an orthodox ideological adherent to. Paul, who I respect greatly, and I find his insights, I have learned much from him, is an orthodox structural Marxist. So Paul's... Real quick correction, Pascal. I was trained okay. uh, in graduate school as a both a phenomenologist as well as a structural Marxist from a, sure. a, a brilliant feminist by the name of Teresa Brennan. So that's where the, the structural Marxism come from. Okay. Yes. The, so do, so you say, do you let people know that you're a trained Marxist, much like yes, being yes. a coterie? Yes. <laughs> a phenomenologist and a structural Marxist. At every conference, I let them know, yes, I'm trained. Uh, so, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Paul's got an analysis and a critique of, strict, of critical race theory that comes from his left Marxist analysis. But before we get into what Paul is saying about critical race theory, I will, and I'm not gonna to claim to be an expert, but I'm not unknown to critical race theory because I took classes on critical race theory when I was in law school. I actually, critical race theory, which started as a legal academic study, a paradigm started largely at Harvard Law School under Derek Bell and a whole coterie of academics, was something that was 
in vogue when I was in law school in the early 90s. I remember vividly reading Derek Bell's book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, my first year of law school, and taking seminars on the ideas and the uh, uh, the, the uh, philosophies that come out of critical race theory. Wasn't that much of a fan of it then, but my, my, my position on it now is even further. Uh, Paul, I would like you to find my position on what I understand of critical race theory is that critical race theory is a legal school of thought that is rooted in exposing the historical functionality of the American legal system as a way in which race is the primary motivating factor behind the way in which law and its functionality and utility is practiced in American society. This is an academic discipline that is rooted in the American legal system in its origin. It had nothing to do with general American history. It had nothing to do with whiteness studies. It had nothing to do with Robin D'Angelo. It was about an analysis of the American legal history rooted in arguing that if not the primary, one of the primary motivating factors behind legal development of American law was the subjugation of black people. Now. It is a form of radical radical liberalism. It is a, I, I would agree with you there. Now, in terms of the trajectory of where this comes from, I saw a podcast, well, a recent podcast, I'm not going to name their name, where they tried to make the argument that critical race theory has Marxist origins. I say, I think I sent you a text of that podcast. Yes, yes. I think, and I think Paul will agree, I think that's fundamentally incorrect. Derek Bell himself, one of the founders of critical race theory, said he had no use for Marxism. As a matter of fact, if you read one of the most extensive compendiums of the works of critical race theory, I mean, thousands of pages, they cite or mention Marx maybe one or two times at best. The main reason why people are arguing that critical race theory has Marxist origins is because they're trying to equate critical race theory with the phenomenon of critical studies or critical scholarship that mm -hmm. comes out of what was known as the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School were Marxist intellectuals who left Germany during the rise of the Nazi uh, Holocaust and came to the United States. These are people like Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, and gentlemen of that light, who, because they were seeing how America, during the rise of the New Deal, and how the working class was being de-radicalized because of the largesse of the New Deal, they became very, very cynical, I would argue, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. on the revolutionary capacity of Marxism in the West post-World War II and developed an analysis rooted in a critical critique of how American and Western capitalism was socializing working class Americans and turning them into things like one dimensional people. One of the more important analysis of the Frankfurt School comes to, uh, through analysis of popular culture, analysis of film, of media. So the Frankfurt School was rooted in a critical Marxist analysis of the way in which capitalism post-World War II, post-New Deal, had become such a phenomenon of critical realism 
that it had neutralized the revolutionary capacity of the working class. Am I correct or incorrect, Paul? Yeah, right. What what would happen is there two arms would emerge out of critical race theory. As you point out, there's that critical legal studies component with the, people like Derek Bell, et cetera, coming out of the Harvard School. And then you would get late, much later on, uh, people like Cornell West, Paul Gilroy, who would attempt to marry uh, the negative dialectic of the Frankfurt School into a critique of uh, Western institutions. Now, so they moved away from the dialectical component. Uh, uh, the the Marxist Can you explain dialectic. before? Okay. Let's explain terms. Okay. Explain okay. what the Frankfurt School negative dialectic was. Okay, uh, negative dialectic, a title by the same name, written by Theodore Adorno. It's a form of identitarian uh, logic and philosophy. And what negative dialectic argues is that because remember the front for school, they're trying to understand the origins of fascism that would emerge po the, uh, during the war World War II and after. So they wanted to understand the dynamics, the 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 fun, what led to the rise of Hitler and others, uh, um, the Soviet Union as well. So you would have works like Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man as well as his Soviet Marxism, you would get works like Theodore Adorno's uh, uh, Negative Dialectic. And there, there's also a critique of uh, the Enlightenment project itself, because what they realize is reason itself became a form, whereas reason during the Enlightenment was a form of progress uh, leading us to freedom. In the end, what happened was the Enlightenment project that with its emphasis on reason came in turn to oppress uh, individuals because reason became reified as George Lukash argues in, in, um, in his work. So how do we fight that? How do we fight against reason itself becoming oppressive? And Adorno came up with this notion called this concept of negative dialectic where we must constantly think against the very system we're fighting in. And you can see how that would marry so nicely with uh, this critique of institutions and, and, and critiques of social structure that we, we would find in uh, critical race theory. Because by arguing in negative dialectic that one must always constantly fight against the reification of systems and institutions and social structure, there's an easy marriage between that and the notion in critical race theory that the American institutions themselves were constituted, when they were constituted, were based on race and racism. So it was easy for people like Cornell and, and, and Paul Gilroy to marry this, but as Pascal points out, that is not the initial initiative of critical race theory, uh, uh, the critical race theory that would emerge out of uh, critical legal uh, critical uh, legal studies, which is more of a radical uh, uh, form of liberalism where the, the emphasis is on demystifying the racial component of these laws for a colorblind, and even then, even when crit in legal, critical legal studies, when they point out the fact that a colorblind uh, uh, law as it is written in praxis, it is not colorblind. So that was the emphasis of uh, critical legal studies. So this whole notion of demystifying the racial component of the laws and the institutions of America, the, the, the idea was in doing so, you would lead to greater progress for blacks and more integration of black people into the society. But the fact that reason itself, as Adorno points out in the negative dialectics, cannot do that unless you are constantly thinking about or thinking against the very institutions by which we recursively reorganize and reproduce our being in the world. So that was the negative uh, dialectical component that many uh, uh, left-leaning Marxists like uh, um, Cornell West tried to implement in cri critical le uh, race theory. This is a very important. So let's recap. Negative dialectics, which was a part of the Frankfurt School critical studies component, which is about realizing that structures that exist in a society are something that you must constantly challenge or they will reify themselves in an oppressive, oppressive. 
and become oppressive. Yes. Right. Understanding that the Frankfurt School scholars were Marxist, we would also understand that part of that dialectic is about challenging the hierarchy of capital, mm -hmm. right? And as you said, part of the, the argument of the negative dialectics out of the Frankfurt School is that you can never stop yes. fighting those hierarchies. Yes, absolutely. Those hierarchies should be con consistently, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you could argue maybe like some Trotsky say, the permanent, rev the permanent revolution. Revol exactly, you know, exactly. The very famous belief of, of the Trotskyists. But you said something very important. The critical legal studies component that comes out of Derek Bell makes the argument that the negative dialectics in other words, fighting the structures should be done until what? <laughs> Black people are able to be integrated, integrated. into the system and function in the system equally as everyone else, particularly per law. the law. Per the law. Which the then law. is colorblind. Which is colorblind. Yes. And people will ask, well, what's wrong with that? Because what happens at that point, you take away the component that challenges the hierarchy of capitalism. And because you make the hierarchy exclusively racialized, it assumes that democratizing a capitalist economic system and increasing black participation means that capitalism is going to allow all blacks to become integrated into the system. When what we have learned in the history of the 50 year counter revolution, the only thing is that happens when you try to integrate into capitalism is that it integrates a black elite tier and it further cannibalizes into poverty, the black poor and what are considered the working poor or the black underclass. Yes. We're, we're, the, the, the thing is, we're OK with the structural differentiation that emerges within capitalist uh, uh, relations of production. Uh, if you understand American society, and this is why many scholars will argue it is the racial component that prevented the class revolution that emerged in Europe, which is why I did, it was easy for 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 this counter, this this 50 year counter revolution to emerge, because in American society, it is acceptable. We, we attribute your poverty to a lack of effort. So the ideology by which we constitute American society is OK with the structural differentiation that emerges out of capitalist relations of production. But we're not OK post uh, uh, post 1954. We're no longer OK with the organization of race or organizing around race and racial segregation. Even your your rightest right person on the right will argue, yes, I'm I'm against organizing our society about race, but we're not against organizing the society around class differentiation. And this is, I think, is is fundamental to understanding uh, uh, the American the, the constitution of the American relations of production. We're even black people are okay with class structural differentiation to some extent, because we will attribute your poverty to your lack of effort, to, to your cultural, your, defect. cultural deficiencies, et cetera, as Thomas Sowell and many conservative black economists have made the argument for. Pound cake speech. <laughs> So we're OK with that. But post-1954, we're not OK with racial. Uh, uh, uh. And the thing with critical legal studies and critical and the component, the critical legal studies component of critical race theory is the fact that they're speaking about not individual racism and individual prejudices. They're speaking about institutional racism and structural racism as opposed to individual racism. The law can cannot uh, uh, adjudicate individual racism. But according to legal critical legal studies, the law can adjudicate institutional and structural racism. And that's what the critical, the legal side of critical race, race theory is promoting. Now, the Cornell West negative dialectical component is what they're trying to do is use the to make that argument not only to legislate against individual racism, but also institutional and cultural racism as well. 
But again, this is the thing. Because the differentiation between the Frankfurt School who uses negative dialectics or the argument that you must consistently fight against structures in a society because they will reify oppression mm -hmm. is that because they were Marxists, they realized the crux of that oppression is economic hierarchy. And as a result, that you've got to challenge capitalism. But when we get to the negative dialectics of critical legal studies and even the critical dialectics of critical race studies, the effect is to challenge the hierarchies until you yes. neutralize racial oppression. Yes. Okay, and this is the thing. And that means if you, and if you neutralize racial oppression, right? Mm -hmm. In a capitalist hierarchy, then literally follow the logic here, people. No, you remain with listen, listen, class. Listen, what, you, what you can say is that there are 14% of the population that is white, that is black. 60 some odd plus are, are white, and the rest are other ethnic. As long as 14% of black people are in the ruling class and the proper percentage of white people are in the ruling class, according to their number, and Latinos and Asians, as long as that percentage is in the ruling class, since the racial stigmatization is gone, everyone else, white, black, or otherwise, as long as they're represented by percentage, can be slaves in America is great. <laughs> no, I, I would agree. And the other component, and the, there's two. Am I problems. am I correct? Or yes, no, you're, you're you're absolutely right. There's two problems that I find with critical race theory. The first problem is, is the critical in critical race theory is problematic for me. Number one, I don't believe it's critical enough. That's one. The second problem that I have with with critical race theory is the fact that if you and this is an attack on the Cornell West, the, the negative dialectical side of critical race theory. If you remember, the Frankfurt School are looking at how the institutions, and here Althusser's work, Louis Althusser's work is so important. And he has a structural Marxist reading of capital and of Marx as well, more of a Hegelian reading of, uh, of Marx. The institutions themselves, and this is what structural Marxism argues, the institutions themselves are in place to reproduce the relations of production. So Mark Lamont Hill is wrong. And the problem with Mark Lamont Hill, he conflates a, the, the, the structural Marxism of Althusser with, with, with the structuralism that comes out of linguistics. That's why I hate when you have intellectuals in, in, in uh, during media stuff because they tend to speak too fast. Marx is saying there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the economic base and the ideological superstructure. Structure. This is why the reification of the ideological superstructure, the, the, the reification of the institutions, whether it is the law, your police force, how we organize our streets, all of these are what Althusser called ideological state apparatuses. They are in place to reproduce the, the social relations of production. So if critical race theory is attacking the institution solely on racial ground, now there's another component of critical race theory that tries to make the Kimberly Crenshaw intersectional argument, and I think that's foolishness as well. But if their attack is on the, the, the institutions from a racial standpoint, you play, you post no threat to the forces and relations of production because it is the, the institutions simply replace the forces of product the relations of production so how you attacking the the lack of black or the in, impact of the institutions on preventing remember if you look at it clearly critical race theory is arguing that Blacks cannot participate in the social structure because there are inst the institutions were put in place to prevent them from participating in the social structure. So if your attack is on the institutions that are preventing Blacks from participating in the social structure, once you, uh, once you institutionalize yeah. colorblindness, what happens? And Blacks are able to participate in the society. Are you then saying now 
we have a fair and equitable society and now nothing matters. And this is the brilliant work of Nancy Frazier who wrote Justice Interrupt This. It, 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 it piggybacks on what you said, this 50 year counter revolution because what have black people been fighting for since Brown versus the Board of Education? It's integration, equality of opportunity, recognition and distribution. Now, how does that undermine the, the relations of production, it doesn't. It just gives you bigger fat back and biscuits and a nicer house in a suburban neighborhood. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, can you guys see the super chat that I got on the screen right now from uh, our brother Jeremy uh, that actually helps us out? With can the professor talk about what bits of Althusser we should hang on to and which bits we can uh, safely cast away, if any? Oh, that's a question. <laughs> For me personally, I hold on to to Althusser's essay. His reading of Marx is, is brilliant. I believe it, it, his Hegelian reading of Marx and the title of his book is Reading of Marx as well is brilliant. I, I, I believe his critique of Marx and this there is a distinction that is drawn in Marxist uh, uh, circles between the younger Marx and the the the, the older Marx, and he argues that many scholars are just reading the older Marx into the younger version, but we have to see Marx as progressively evolving his views. That's A. And his other essay, which is I think is undervalued, is ideology, ideology and ideological state apparatuses. I think that is one of the most brilliant essays that Althusser has ever produced. Um, and then he, if, and there he, he actually draws, uh, 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 he outlines how every institution is in place to re uh, 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 recursively reproduce the social relations of production. That's what makes the, the essay brilliant. And remember, Althusser is simply building off, and here Mark Lamont Hill is correct, he is building off the, the, the linguistics of uh, Saussure, but however, he's just replacing uh, structural linguistics with relations of production. Uh, and he's building off the work of uh, uh, the French scholar, well, he studied the French, but he's not French, Alexander Kojev, who, who takes a Hegelian ter term uh, to Marxism. And that's what Althusser is doing as well. He's taking a Hegelian turn. He's actually saying, no, we need to focus. And this is what the Frankfurt School do as well. We need to start focusing. I know this, Pascal and I will disagree here. Pascal is constantly making a, a reference to materialist relations. We need to focus on materialist relations and stop focusing on race, blah, blah, blah. But what the Frankfurt School and Althusser, what they're saying is not, no, there is no way we can experience material reality anymore because material reality has been uh, 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 basically the institutions have replaced the material reality. So we no longer have any direct contact with the material environment. What we have are contacts with the ideas of institutions. In other words, we're so immersed in the ideological superstructure that we've achieved what is called yes. capitalist realism. And, and that's why Theodore Adorno argues that the biggest threat to humanity is the cultural industry. Uh, uh, Paul Disney was the biggest threat to uh, my, this is my, my, fa my you know, favorite. You know, and you don't understand, Pascal was talking about we were on a show earlier uh today mm -hmm. the pop culture we we the i use industry is culture, my i use pop culture as a way to kind of explain stuff to people mm -hmm. marks even even crime bills we we're always using pop culture as a way to explain it for example uh used robocop as a way to explain neoliberalism mm -hmm. you know um pascal hates pop culture <laughs> we were on the show he literally said every what you're saying he literally said that verbatim it's almost as if you guys might be friends and talk yeah you know, because <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the 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 culture the culture industry analysis of the frankfurt school yes paul knows he's read my work is a very important part of my park by my pop culture critiques particularly yes. the piece i wrote on uh, Kanye West and the piece I wrote on Clarence Avant because I use and 
obviously, you know, I, I was influenced a lot by Adolf Reed because he started doing this using how black popular culture is used by the culture industry, not only to reify racial subjugation, but racial subjugation within the 50 year counter revolution and the rise of neoliberalism. And um, that's one of the reasons why I am a fan of the Frankfurt School is because of its analysis of the culture industry, which I think is one of its most valuable contributions. The right wing hates the Frankfurt School. They call it, you know, the cultural uh, market. Uh, and cultural they would. Market. So, you know, and they would, because what it does is that it demonstrates all of the internal bankruptcy of all of the institutions at the height of capitalist development, which is during the New Deal and afterwards from the 50s into the 60s, and shows how, and one of the reasons why you know, morons like Jordan Peterson hate the quote unquote cultural Marxists is because the corrosion of American society caused yes. by neoliberalism has demonstrated itself and it's fallen on itself. And they tried to use the phenomenon that actually predicted this to blame it for the actual problem. When in reality, the problem is rooted in the political economy and capitalism's always need to cannibalize itself regularly, i.e. what happened in 2008 with the Great Recession and the economic crash. And, and what, what we see is it, it's actually paradoxical because on the one hand, you have the, the left power elites. And by left, I mean the, your political left, your, 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 your democratic left in this country who actually u- utilize the, the cultural industry to reproduce capitalist relations of production. And then you have the right who are fighting it because, it, as you clearly stated, it's eroding traditional American values. Say it again for the people in the back who might think they're smoking crack. Say it again. Say it again. And, and, and it's interesting because right after grad school, I wrote a book called The African Americanization of the Black Diaspora. And what I argue is that what's happening throughout the Black Diaspora is that uh, uh, the Black power elites, and in, in this I include your rappers, your artists, your athletes, etc. They have become the bearers of ideological and linguistic, uh, uh, the bear uh, domination in the diaspora. So when you travel throughout Africa, when you travel throughout, uh, it's funny, I was finishing the book when I was in St. Lucia and St. Lucia is a, it used to be a French colony and then the English took it over, etc. And throughout the country, you see a young of Creole speaking black kids wearing uh, uh, uh Tupac shirts, Biggie, they're riding in roll, uh, low riders, listening to gangster rap and had no clue what they were saying. So what I argue in that book was that uh, the black power elites, meaning athletes, rappers, have become the bearers of ideological and linguistic domination in neoliberal capitalism. And they are used as such uh, uh, by your, your, your fi- by finance capital. So let's um, break this down again. What you are saying is that the cultural production of black popular culture in in the 50 year counter revolution particularly with the rise of urban hip hop is used yes. as an exporter to of, in bourgeois blacks to ca- of capitalist production values and socialization to the african diaspora and and to inculcate them yes, in absolutely. the the a- the economic aspirations of basically Black capitalism via popular culture. A- a- absolutely. Uh, so that makes the front for school were on point when they critique the cultural industry. Because it, in post-industrial capital, capitalism, it becomes the means of embourgeoisie, as, as Althusser would say. And what becomes particularly fascinating and important for those who have not read my book, my my, my book, my book, book is coming, my piece on Clarence Savat and the ruling class use of black popular culture. There's a video did, essay coming on that. Just hold right. Yeah. What is particularly fascinating is that the move to mass financialization of black popular culture starts off with the current commission report that demands that this is to be done as a means of neutralizing yeah, the urban rebellion yes. happening all over the United States from 1967 to 1971. We have Absolutely. 300 urban rebellions in 1968, I believe. Uh, Johnson re, uh, issues out the current commission report. And in the new media section, of the Kerner Commission report, 
basically the solution that is proposed is flood television and interest in music and everything with black images, black popular culture, black music. And he even there's a there's a there is a citation in that segment where they are literally signifying the creation of a TV show like Good Times. We must have TV shows that fo focus on the urban poverty of the day. If Jason can link to that piece, I would love it. But the larger point of the matter is, is that what is particularly nefarious about the way in which after these urban rebellions between 67 to 71, you start seeing Soul Train, Good Times, yes. Yeah. Hyper hi fi sound black soul music. You know, it's all of a sudden we get flooded with all this deep soul dance disco. All of this popular Absolutely. cultural production becomes infused at a time in which the economy is crashing in the 70s, but yet cultural production of black popular culture is inundated in mass marketization. Why? To demobilize black radicalism. I, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and it's funny, I have a paradoxical relationship with, with, the, with the Cosby show, because on the one hand, the Cosby show, and, this, and here I disagree with Michael Eric Dyson and his critique of uh, um, Bill Cosby, but on the one hand, the Cosby show undermined that, and, 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 and at, at the beginning, it you know, undermined that. I disagree with you there. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I was going similar to this the other day on the phone. <laughs> like, you know why? Because I was growing up in your. When does the Cosby? First of all, I want to say I'm a little older than you, Paul. So yes, <laughs> black kid. The Cosby Show comes out when I'm in high school in New York yes. City. Mm -hmm. All right. The Cosby Show is a television program for those who are not familiar, probably a few, about an upper middle class elite black family. Husband's a lawyer, wife, husband's a doctor, wife is a lawyer, who live in a nice brownstone in Brooklyn, in New York City, starting in 1983 or 84, going on to the early 90s in which they are living in Shangri-La. There's no discussion about racism. The kids are wonderful. There's everything. a racism. Everything's lovely, lovely, lovely. This is going on during Yousef Hawkins. This is going yes. to Bernard Getz. This yes. is going to the mayoralty of Ed Koch, one of the most notoriously racist mayors in the modern history of New York City, where New York was literally a racial fire pit for black and brown people. And all of a sudden, of the only mainstream television show you have about black life in America doing the Reagan revolution yes. of reactionary right is Negroes living on Sh Shangri-La talking about we love jazz. And yes. honey, I'm <laughs> Absolutely, brother. Counter revolutionary. Pascal's just mad because you know him and his family was doing that lip sync shit. <laughs> 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 but 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 paradoxically, Pascal, it undermined what the cultural industry was attempting to do at the time. Though, and That's this true. is what you have to uh, look at it, and this is why I have a paradoxical relationship with it. Because in, in Bill Cosby attempting to display this, he was undermining this flooding of underclass culture as the as the bearer of ideological and linguistic domination in, in, in America. And remember, simultaneously, what you have to realize is you start to see around the Cosby show this rise of Afrocentric culture because one of the critiques of Bill Cosby was Malifi Asante. He had a big critique of, uh, uh, against Bill Cosby because Bill was out there saying Shanene is not an African name. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So we have to, and this is why I was saying I have a paradoxical relationship with the Cosby Show, because on the one hand, it was undermining what the, what the left, the neoliberal left, was trying to do with Black underclass culture, hip-hop culture. Now, brother, hip-hop culture is the neoliberal project. It, it, it is... It is avant-garde. You are considered avant-garde, a black avant-garde. If you're saying, look at Jay-Z. Jay-Z is black avant-garde, brother. Whereas, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. no, no. I mean, listen, man. Listen, as someone who grew up in New York City and watched the birth of hip-hop culture, hip-hop culture was a very effective manifestation and manipulation by the capitalist neoliberal cultural industry to neutralize all forms of black musical cultural production. And what made hip hop particularly fascinating, right, is that it's the first form of black culture, musical production, 
musical production where the cultural component almost becomes more important than the musical component. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Absolutely, brother. You're absolutely right. And, and it, it, it is that cultural component early on that, I'm sorry, later on that they would attack. Remember, there is the, 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 there's two facets that would take place out of hip hop. There was that gangster rap avenue that would t just overtake hip hop. Right. Out of to, to, be, to be fair, because in my era, in my youth, and again, right, I'm, in, I'm, I'm a teenager of the 80s. Mm -hmm. I know this is overplayed. But there was a kind of Afrocentric romanticism, kind of black nationalist fetishism in yes. certain segments. Of certain segment of hip hop. You had, you know, uh, you had KRS One. KRS One. You have X Clan. You yes. have Four Righteous Teachers. Absolutely. You had, uh, um, you have uh, even the brothers who come out of the Five Percenters, the Five Percent of Nature of Islam. So, you know. We shouldn't generalize and say no, absolutely all not. of it was rooted no, in no, kind no, no. of degenerate kind of like, you know, this, you know, co cocaine culture. No, that well, we turn, have to that, emphasize. That turn, that turn starts with the advent kind of like of NWA and particularly with the yes. chronic, with the chronic yes. that comes out in yes. 91. Yes. And then we start to win West Coast, no, 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 no hate to my West Coast brothers, but the gangsterization mm -hmm. of the music becomes exacerbated. Yes. And, it's, and basically what happens is that both coasts end up competing each other for replicating this gangsterization. No, it, and, and it became institutionalized as well. It has to do with like, let's just be honest about like just sales. And if you really want to talk yes. about the beginning of gangster rap music, that shit starts in Philadelphia. Starts in New York with PS2, PS2, kicking that thing. My brother's from Philly. That's right. That's right. That's yeah, right. That's right. That's right. And then yep. it takes off with with ISP and and uh, also keep in mind Hollywood is where movies are made. You get the breaking movies. I think there was like a rapping movie made out here. Uh, and then Ice T takes off with Six in the Morning, and you have N.W.A. You know coming on on his uh, on his coattails because also you know to your point about being avant garde, it was shocking. Yes. But look, we have to be honest about shock yes. music in the age of Reagan. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, uh, and Torrey Reed makes his Torrey makes a great analysis. It was cheap to produce. It was <laughs> Hella. You didn't have to pay a band. No. If at you, all. you guys knew some of the stories I've heard about rap budgets when these guys were signing with major labels, labels like Electra going like, we don't know how much money you need because we produce Anita Baker. And it is, that's like a $2 million record just recording it. And you fools just need a DJ and a microphone. You know, we don't, we don't know that all you need is a, is a $50,000 in a dream. So like the budgets those dudes were getting were on another level with the exposure. And then also we're not talking about, I mean, I don't know how deep you guys want to go down this rabbit hole. Like who, writes the articles that were saying that this was the the next great thing i mean for ray's take on nwa he says he feels like it was a dw griffith idea <laughs> i necessarily don't feel that bad about it but, but I, I see what he means but you know what pascal the key the fundamental point for me is why is there a need to hold on if you have colorblind legislation correct can we make the argument for argument's sake? Can we make the argument if you look at the Constitution, if you look at the law on its face today, you can make the argument that we have colorblind legislation compared to, let's say, fifth uh, prior to Brown versus the Board of Education. If we have, if we can make the argument that we have colorblind legislation, why are these black elites fighting so hard for critical race theory? There's well, no need for it. Stop! Stop! They didn't start fighting until Til yes. the age of Obama. Yes, absolutely. Because one of the main things that happens in the 50-year counter-revolution is that black movement politics falls asleep. Fall and we get the post-racial, quote-unquote, post-racial president like Obama. 
And we get, and Jason, if you can find that magazine, the Ebony magazine, people are talking about, oh, Reagan was horrible. The 19, August 1987, Ebony magazine, a black publication, has a picture of a black man in a business suit and a black woman in a business suit, the new black middle class. Mm -hmm. Are you in or are you out? You're going to tell me that black people were not celebrating the rise of the black middle class during the Reagan years? Really? True, true story. Um, when Obama is running for the first term, I'm, I'm teaching at um, Bethune Cookman University at the time. And do you know, brother, they canceled classes and have bus, they took the students in bus loads to go vote. And <laughs> prior to that, they had convocation in which the president of the university at the time said, and I quote, we all know who we're going in there to vote for. They canceled my class they would bust the students to go vote. And brother, I, I, I took a stand. I was like, no, I, I, I disagree with what's going on. But, you know, this was the move for them. This was post-racial. And race, think about it. During oh, the man, you see, I don't know if you saw the post. I said, listen, man, the cruelest, but one of the cruelest political tricks the ruling class in this country ever did to black people in America was the manufacture of the Obama presidency, man. Absolutely, absolutely, but 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 you you can't talk to you can't talk about that in Black America, brother. <laughs> it, it's right middle class. You, know. you walk into churches now. It used to be MLK and White Jesus. Now we have MLK, White Jesus, and Obama. So you, it, 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 it's, it's. I think that there's a generation. I think that I, I'm I'm more optimistic optimistic in the numbers of particularly under 40 black people. Under 40 black people realize that Obama gave black folk a raw deal. And under 40 black people realize it. And there are some black folk who will start, listen, as much as we may find some, and we don't, we, I don't want to name names because I don't want to go into them. Some of these pseudo movement online phenomenon hashtag movements that we have today, problematic and pseudo movements, mm -hmm. many of them, the one thing that's consistent, they all realize that Obama was a failure for black no, people. No, absolutely, absolutely. And the, and, the, and the sad thing is, think about it. I would argue the only reason we have those movements, whether they be Black Lives Matter, ADOS, FBA, whatever they are, is because Obama was a failure for black people. I would agree. I, I would definitely agree with that. I, I and, and look how you know black folk undermined the Bernie Sanders movement. If it with the help of well, the Obamas, again, of course. Well, again, as we have said before, and I have said before, the most threatening thing to the American ruling class in America today is not the Congressional Black Caucus. No, absolutely not. It's o Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Now, I'm not saying she's a threat to the ruling class. What they perceive as more problematic is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Absolutely. Not because she's all challenged to the state of the ruling class. She's not. No. I'm not singing her praises at all. What I'm saying is that the realization of the possibility of having a socialist politics in name only surrounded by young, charismatic people in America that people are behind is one of the main reasons why you find Jamie Dimon saying, we got to fight the racial wealth gap, but won't talk about Medicare for all or federal mm -hmm. jobs guarantee. Because yeah. Jamie Dimon realizes that as long as he pushes what Preston Smith called racial democracy, which will always lead to what? more fat back and biscuits inclusion for the black elite, whether it's reparations or anything else. He knows that black folk, particularly the majority of educated black folk, are not going to do the thing that is the greatest fear to the ruling class. They're not going to join people like Ocasio-Cortez and say, we demand a public goods form of government. Absolutely. No, I would agree with you. I would agree with you on that point as well. She, she is the... And I was surprised. Truth be told, I was surprised about the whole Bernie Sanders. And my, I'm a, I'm pessimistic, and that's the problem with structural Marxism. Structural Marxism makes you a pessimistic scholar. Well, I mean, listen, we shouldn't fetishize Sanders. Fe Sanders had a message that was important. He ended up being a coward and, su and surrendering to the Democratic Party. But the problem is, 
and this is a critique once again if jordan peterson wants to critique uh, um the front risk school this is a, a, a legitimate critique is how do you explain within Frankfurt School discourse? How do you explain the rise of a of a Bernie Sanders campaign in American society? That 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 was shocking to me, and I think it's the economic collapse that gave us a rise of. Of course, Bernie it was. Sanders. This is all come on, man. As a dialectical yeah. materialist, you got to yeah. know that the contradictions of capitalism yeah. and the material realities of the two thousand eight crash is what set this all in motion. Come on, man. You think all these kids right now with their Ivy League degrees would have t shirt would have t shirts on with pictures Absolutely of Che Guevara? If we didn't have the two thousand eight crash, they will be counting their bond their bond holdings right yeah, now, absolutely. trying for absolutely. jobs at, at Goldman Sachs. Come on, absolutely, man. brother. Bitcoin <laughs> or investing in Bitcoin. Jesus, investing in Bitcoin. <laughs> no, I, I I would agree with, with you on that, but it, it, it's it's problematic. Um, I I think as an analytical tool, critical race theory, it, it, number one, I don't think it's it, it's viable well, in the thing, time. Though, we got, I mean. Uh, Paul, do you have time to go into the uh, patrons only section? With <laughs> well, you How break. long is that, brother? <laughs> as long as you can stay with us, brother. As as I, stay sure, with no us. problem. Because remember, uh, I, I'm coming back from New York for my uncle's funeral. <laughs> yeah, condolences, by the way, to thank your you, uncle, by you. the way, who was a pillar in Haitian compa music, by the way. Yes, man. definitely. Uncle, Absolutely. Uncle Belly Zare, who passed away, man. Very yes, short thank you, man. Thank, thank you. About that, Paul. But yeah. um, what I want to talk to you about is that how all of this discourse is a fuel for the same fascism these neoliberals are saying they're afraid of of dealing with with the rise of trumpism <laughs> but but it it, it is a fuel cuz pascal in the age of trumpism what you have is a glorification of the self and the identity and the commodification of identity as the means to generate economic gain as a means to generate profit remember we're posting this shift from industrialism to post-industrialism is also a shift in how capital is accumulated whereas now capital is accumulated through a commodification of the self and the commodification of identity there is a need to reify racial identities there is a need to racial uh, uh, reify sexual identities there because is Ford, you mean because Amazon and the Ford Foundation will cut you checks? Absolutely, absolutely. It, checks are cut to the. Not only are checks cut to leaders of these reified identity uh, 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 folks, but also profit is generated via the market. Remember, there are there are commercials now that are earmarked for same gender, transgender, black people mixed race people there is there there is this commodification of identity in a celebration of the self that promotes and this is why the the neoliberal left needs <coughs> identity politics they need critical race theory because it is a reification of this is how black folks approach issues you can market to this Think about it, Pascal. How well, well, yeah, it's practical politics because it is politics because they have a more diverse, they have a more racial diverse coalition. So since the only thing they can prov promise is more black and brown people on the chairs of the Death Star, absolutely, absolutely, this is post-industrial capitalism. This does not happen in in an industrial-based economy. In an industrial-based economy where the emphasis is on the nuclear family, as the Frankfurt School points out, it is on the reproduction of the nuclear family. It is on, on father going to work, bringing home money, blah, 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 et cetera. That's this, it, you don't have that in post-industrial capitalism because the intent is not on reproducing the nuclear family. You have all yeah. sorts of families. I was just reading an article that Torre posted and we were talking about the despair of poor white Americans from the Atlantic, which talks about all of the urban pathologies, brother, that, mm -hmm. we were, that were told by Moynihan that were going to plague black America mm -hmm. after the civil rights movement are all befalling the white poor all over Absolutely. the country. So were they culturally defective or were they genetically defective as Charles Murray would say? Well, Murray might argue that they were, but what, what, what people like Jordan Peterson exist to do 
is to take those poor disaffected whites who've been crushed by the 50-year counter-revolution and neoliberalism and tell them, oh, it's the cultural Marxist. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's the, it's, the, it's, the it's the failure to celebrate the divine magicness of the black, of the man and masculinity. It's the yes. chaos of, femini of feminism that yes. is done this, when in reality, the political economy of capitalism included all of these identities because they realized they needed to profit from them to increase the marketization of identity as a means of reifying capital, which is good for capitalism. As Absolutely. you and, and think about that. You, you remove critical race theory from the black elites, Mark, Lamont, Hill, all of them. What do you have left to address the, 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 the black underclass? You have nothing left. And they see the class, right? And it's, it's actually paradoxical because if the right is successful in ridding itself of critical race theory in the public sphere, you are then left with the masses of people who now stand against the elites and are looking at, okay, we don't have race to talk about anymore. We don't have gender to talk about. We have this racial democracy. The only thing left, Pascal, is classism the structural differentiation of capitalist relations of production. The, it, the, the right is actually hanging themselves. By attacking critical race theory, you also are attacking somewhat capitalism because when, when the elites are no longer left with critical, when the black elites are no longer left with critical race theory, the black masses now must confront the, the, the clash differentiation within their own community. And this is already happening because this is, is the discourse yeah. we're seeing online. This is yes. why you're having people is talking about the boule Negroes. Yes, absolutely. That it's discourse was not happening. When during the last 50 year kind of revolution have you seen, and I'm not talking about black elites and intellectuals, regular ass black folk challenge class hierarchies, even though they're doing it very clumsily yes. without yes. intellectual clarity or good yes. politics. Yes. Absolutely. When have you seen, shout out to Black Agenda Report for popular, popularizing the critique of the black political class, some call the black misleadership mm -hmm. class. When you have articles in the new in in, in uh, the, the the New Yorker now, we have young black people talking about the failures of the black political class. What is happening? And this is basically the theme of my book, Fracture from Obama to Trump and the Crisis of Black Politics, is mm -hmm. that the failures of capitalism in the age of the fifty year counter revolution, particularly with heightened neoliberalism mm -hmm. to address the contradictions of race, class, and capital in America are forcing the contradictions to become so sharp that the unified notion of black political participation is up for grabs. Yes, now. absolutely. absolutely. You got some black men talking about, oh, I like Trump. Reactionary politics. And Reactionary politics. Absolutely. Re re reactionary politics and nativism is taking hold. And now the whole notion of racial ventriloquists is up for question. Do you see the comment section of Mark Lamont Hill's videos? Man? <laughs> Negro <laughs> were killing that guy. They were. They were killing him. And rightly so. Rightly so, Pascal. Because now what you find, because think about it. Look at the amount of black folks who voted for Trump, black males in particular who voted for it Trump. It was small, but the thing is, though, you, why is the guy who's supposed to be Hitler and Goebbels combined exactly from black men? It, it, yeah, that's the, because there was this emphasis on hyper masculinity, because this notion of the identity politics folks are taking over, and it's an attack on black masculinity. This is a conversation we want to have in this show well, that no one is talking about. How the crisis of masculinity is fueling the reactionary right in America. Absolutely. And it's cross racial. I, th I think we had a good first hour. Um, man, we went a little that longer. Was fast. I, I, we went a little longer than I thought we were going to go. But uh, I'm very happy with, with the way the show went. Pascal, how are you feeling? Feeling good, man. I hope we didn't. Did we not talk enough about critical race theory, or did we hit it? Um, there's some people that wanted. Uh, uh, there was a, a person that wanted you to get into your uh, some of your theories from your article. They actually read it. Okay. But when you hear the music, that means the show was over, much like the Grammys. Thank you, Dr. Paul C. McComb. We appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. 
condolences to you and your family. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to talk some more shit with us in the second half. It's just patrons only, so you can feel a lot more comfortable with uh, <laughs> getting even looser. Because Pascal can't wait. Because he's are you are you enjoying yourself, Pascal? This is all great for me, man. This is good stuff. This we haven't had an episode this popular since Finkelstein was on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I watched that one. <laughs> <laughs> he went off. He went off. I watched that one. <laughs> this is like a more positive vibe in the chat. That, that was some, uh, fun, hilarious shit. Thank you guys for checking it out. If you haven't done it already, become a patron. If you haven't done it already, please hit subscribe so you can get alerted whenever these these videos happen. And on that note, we are out.